On Flickering Dreams this time, we look at Celine Song's debut feature as writer-director, Past Lives. We also look at Kenneth Branagh's latest outing as Poirot in A Haunting in Venice. The Greek family are back in My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3. We also have The Nun 2, the latest horror film. And finally, on Netflix, Once Upon a Crime. This is Flickering Dreams. <laughs> Let's start on our great cinematic adventure. Uh, I don't know why I'm sounding more like Russell Brand now. I don't want to sound like Russell Brand at the moment. <laughs> this, is, this is not a good look. This is not a good look, people. Yeah, but uh, we're going to press on. The first film we're going to look at uh, tonight is Past Lives. So in South Korea, there is a young couple who are childhood sweethearts, Na Young and Hai Sung. And through various events, including the emigration of the parents to Canada, the two get split up and come back together many years later via a Skype call. And through a subsequent meeting, there are complications because Nora, as she is now called, has been married to Arthur and the childhood sweetheart turns up in New York and complications arise. Here's a clip. Is he attractive? I think so. He's really masculine in this way that I think is so Korean. Are you attracted to him? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. Okay, uh, who are we going to start with? I think we've all seen Past Lives, haven't we? Now, I'm probably about the last one to see it because I think you've all seen it in previews and surprise cinemas and so on. Uh, Emma, let's start with you. What did you make of uh, Celine Song's debut film? I, well, I mean, I'm an emotional wreck at most films. These <laughs> that, it doesn't matter what happens, you know, something will set me off. But Oh, don't get me started with the Meg. Uh. Look. Oh, wow. The octopus. The helicopter and the octopus. You, you mock yeah. me. What a tis my. I do, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed the way it was done. And it was. I found it very impactful, the way the relationship sort of evolved. And really, like, Nora and Arthur, obviously married and when that all comes about that uh you know her old sweetheart is coming to visit and they're having heart to heart it wasn't just done to be cinematic it, it felt very real and I, I really loved the fact that uh i think it was in an interview somewhere that actually when they were like filming everything they tried to keep people apart from each other so that yes arthur and Hi Sung. Hi Sung. Um, they actually met for the first time when they filmed that scene, and I believe that was the yes. first cut as well. Like that was the first go round that we saw. Um, yes. And yeah, just like try to have everyone keep their distance, so it was all very new, and everyone was getting to know each other. And I think mm. that really did help a lot. It was very slow for me uh, at the beginning. I wasn't necessarily enjoying myself. Mm. But as it starts to ramp up, emotions are all over the place and they're you know, just trying to deal with everything. I just really, that's what I sunk in and I was like, I was sold. It, yeah, it really caught me at that yeah. point. Yeah. I don't know whether the interview you heard was the one on the uh, Komodo Mayo take with Celine Song. Uh, but if you've not heard that, um, as we've talked about before, Komodo Mayo have a a struggling little podcast called Take that uh, needs your support. And But they have a fantastic interview with Celine Song uh, and, and she recounted that fact that this was the first meeting between the two actors in, in the room. So it was deliberately kind of hyped up to be a really important scene. So they were really nervous about it anyway. But she also said that this is actually based on the true event that when she and her husband were married in New York, she had a visit from her childhood sweetheart from South Korea, I presume. So, so the whole film is actually 
was written and uh, based on this real life incident and i think that really anchors the film as being so utterly real yeah mm. scott how about you yeah so similar feelings in a way for me i thought i felt like i could easily break this film into three acts so the first act when they were kids i thought that was really sweet i liked the characters just getting to know them the two young child actors sort of played off really well with each other then we move forward 12 years when we get to the middle section, which I'll be honest, this is where I found it quite slow. And I know it was purposely done that way. And I totally appreciate why Celine Song paced it the way she did in this section. But for me personally, when I was sitting in the cinema, I was just thinking, come on, let's let's get going or let something happen. It was just It was just a little bit too slow for me. But I appreciate why other people would like this. However... In the third act, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. We get the scene that Emma was referring to in the bar, which I thought was extremely well written. While we mention about the three of them being at the bar, we find out earlier as well that the husband speaks a little bit of Korean. So he's getting little bits of words and phrases, but he can't put it in full context, which makes it just yeah. more awkward and heartbreaking thinking he's sitting there wondering what they're saying and feeling maybe fears, jealousies, anxieties. And then there's another one where they're in bed having a conversation at night and it just felt like it was going to a place that was so real, so profound in the writing as well. I think that that scene could be speaking to couples all over the world and the sort of things that people think about when they're in a relationship. So I loved that side of it. I think the three main actors were all phenomenal in that final act. And for me, it's one of those where it kept it built up to that ending. And I was thinking by the time it closed, although I didn't love that middle act personally, based on the third act alone, I think this could be a contender for some Oscars. And you guys will remember when we did our early Oscar predictions, I was the only one that <laughs> uh, mentioned past I was lives. Waiting. Yeah. I was waiting for you to drag that one up, Scott. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm proud of that yeah. one. If it makes it. It might <laughs> not, but I think it will. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Andy? Yeah, I mean, I can't really add anything to what Emma and Scott have said. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I was an emotional wreck by the end. For me, it didn't. I didn't worry about the pacing at all in the middle section. I just felt the whole thing flowed beautifully, seamlessly through the years of these two characters' lives. The performances were terrific. I love the score as well. Um, and this has gone in as so far uh, in my top three of the year. And I can't see something absolutely incredible is going to have to come along to dislodge it from at least being in my top five of the year because mm. it's just a beautiful, lovely, wonderful film that... I think embraces the human spirit and just sends you out with a smile. And uh, I absolutely loved it. Can't really add anything to what's been said, except that for me, it didn't lag in the middle section. I just went with the flow and thoroughly enjoyed the seamless way. I felt the film was put together in the three acts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with all of you. Phenomenal film. And given this was the first feature by a Celine song, <laughs> it's it's just extraordinary. I mean, just some really beautiful little physical things like the amount of distance between the characters and the the way that they embrace silence in the thing. And there's a wonderful point where the two young people leave for the last time, and Nora goes up uphill up the path, and uh, Hai Sung basically stays the same level. And you think, what a wonderful metaphor in the film. And there's some wonderful camera blocking. The use of camera angles and so on is is great. And that final five minutes of the film, maybe it's even three minutes of the film, uh, no spoilers here, but I mean, if you, you pushed me for a recent film that had my favourite ending, it would probably be Sound of Metal for the last two or three minutes of that film. But this film with that event that happens in there, and the, the use of silence and so on is, is tenser for me than any of the so-called action films, sorry, make lovers, uh, that we've seen this year. I mean, I, I thought it was just an incredible electric bit of cinema. So terrific. Yeah. 
Goes on the doors. Uh, Emma. Um. I'm a, oh, I've been umming and ahhing. I've got like three scores written down. Um, so I think I'm, I'm going to go just straight down the middle and go with a seven. A seven. Okay. Scott. Oh, yeah, I feel like I'm maybe being a bit sniffy with a score, but I also went with a seven. Okay. <laughs> Andy. I'm going with a ten. I couldn't find a single thing wrong with it. I loved every single frame. Hmm. I will also go with a 10 on this one. I think it's near cinema perfection. The only thing, and one of our colleagues in the Mark Commode Appreciation Society last night over the dinner mentioned this, and there's there's one shot right at the end of a person in a taxi that's added on the end of the film, which is possibly unnecessary. And, yeah. and there's like a perfect end to the film. And it's just, so that was the only thing which I hadn't, kind of noted down in my review but that's the only thing i could really criticize about the film so that is a score of 34 divided by four this is going to be challenging that's eight and a half i think out of ten for the flickering dream score making past lives a monumental <laughs> uh, get out there folks and see it at the cinema on the big screen because it really is a good cinematic kind of widescreen experience Okay, uh, the next film we're looking at uh, couldn't be more different, I think. Well, I guess it could be more different. It could be Oppenheimer, right, or something. But this is A Haunting in Venice. Uh, Emma, can you introduce that to us? Certainly. Uh, Poirot, now retired to Venice, hides from all of those people who are seeking his expertise, being a recluse gardener. Uh, until an old friend knocks at his door and asks for his assistance in finding out the truth about a woman who says she can speak to the spirit world. Here's a clip. I must tell you, madame, I have been all my life uncharmed by your kind. My kind? Opportunists who prey on the vulnerable, no? Huh? You don't believe in the soul's endurance after death. I have lost my faith. How sad for you. Yes, it is most sad. The truth is sad. Please understand, madame, I would welcome with open arms any honest sign of devil or demon or ghost. For if there is a ghost, there is a soul. If there is a soul, there is a God who made it. And if we have God, we have everything, meaning, order, justice. But I have seen too much of the world, countless crimes, two wars, the bitter evil of human indifference. And I conclude, no. No God, no ghosts. With respect, no mediums who can speak to them. Scott, let's start with you for Haunting in Venice, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. So, I'll be honest, I wasn't a great fan of the last two Kenneth Branagh Poirot films, Murder on Northern Express and Death in the Nile. This one, I liked that they twisted it a little bit and put that horror spin onto this genre. I thought that as a narrative, I was quite into it. I couldn't really work out who the murderer was. That's obviously a good thing in these films because the worst thing in a murder mystery is when you can work out too early on what happens. So this one had me. I thought just in terms of the, the look and the production design, they set up this haunted house and I thought it looked really creepy. I thought the way the score sort of lent into sort of classic horror sort of scores and beats, that really impressed me as well. They did attempt a couple of jump scares, which didn't make me jump, but I've got a feeling they might on some people who are not quite as used to horrors as I am. Performance-wise, I thought... So when I did my written review, I said that it was quite a panto performance from most of the cast. I thought a lot of them were over the top in the way they were acting. But in a film like this, for some reason, I didn't really mind it. There was something tonally that worked about that sort of overacting panto type of acting that they were giving. So, yeah, I'm forgiving it on that front. There's, <laughs> there's one thing that I brought up that bugged me when I was watching it. And I think I might be the only person on earth, um, you know, guys, what I'm going to say with this one. Little Jude Hill, that some of you might remind, remember from Belfast. 
the way he was costumed and the glasses and his hair, I felt so distracted by... <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's seen the old British sitcom Alo Alo, there is one of the Nazi characters called Herflick, yeah. and the way that Jude Hill <laughs> is just costumed in this film just reminded me all the time of that character. And so I couldn't take him seriously throughout the whole film because I was just imagining him as like this little Nazi when it's totally not anything to do with that in the slightest. But that put, put is, me off. Here is a comparison picture of the two of them. You make your own mind up. <laughs> I think Scott is in a, a subset of one here. <laughs> but yeah, I think on the whole, this was definitely the best of the three Kenneth Branagh Poirot films. I wouldn't actually mind if we got another one if we kept the whole spinning the murder mystery with a different genre vibe to it um i know we're having a little bit of a joke in our whatsapp group earlier on and yeah i i'd be kind of happy if they carried on this but in different genres Mm. okay andy i i I enjoyed it i mean i went for a spell as a as a teenager well, I read every Agatha Christie book and I read Halloween Party, uh, on which this is based. Thankfully, I couldn't remember very much about it. And in actual fact, the film is very divorced from the book. Basically, it's the same basic plot, but what they've done is taken it in a slightly different direction from the book. <laughs> and um, put it in Venice. And put it in, in Venice as well. Which instead, of yeah. instead of Surrey. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Canterville Ghost is out this weekend, the kids' animated cartoon, which is set in Surrey. So I, I know, I mean, for me, Murder on the Orange Express was the best of the three. I really enjoyed that. This comes in second. I was really disappointed with Death on the Nile. Didn't work. I thought that whoever, the murderer was obvious from the start. There was only one person it really could have been. And I thought some of the performances, despite the presence of French and Saunders and others, were a bit lackluster. Uh, this one was really good. It, it, it was just your typical Agatha Christie plot, the Agatha Christie structure where we get the crime, then we get another crime, and then another one, and then he gets everybody together at the end and all is revealed. So it's nice, safe, comfortable film that I felt filled a couple of hours very nicely in the cinema. Not Nothing spectacular, but enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Emma? Yeah, I mean, very similar thoughts on it. I have to say that there was not a lot... I knew it was coming. I have a friend who's obsessed with Kenneth Branagh, so every second it's like, oh my God, it's like eight days until it comes out. But uh, <laughs> I had not seen any trailers or anything for it. So the week before it was out, finally saw a trailer in the cinema. And I was like, oh, this looks amazing. Like I was getting really good thriller vibes. I was like, oh, maybe it is, like you say, Scott mixing it with the horror. It's going to change everything up. I came out and I was very disappointed that the trailer really did portray something that, in my opinion, the film was not. I was expecting it to be much, much more edgy than it than it was. And I think, although the the setting was amazing, you know, the just the atmosphere, everything was perfect for this horror thriller detective story. The rest of it felt very much like it was just pulled from one of the first two films, which, as you said, like Andy said, it, you know, completely enjoyable to watch, pass some time, nothing disagreeable, but it really did feel like I was not getting what I was promised from that trailer, which was like the trailer like gave me goosebumps. I was like, oh, I, can't, I can't wait. Yeah, to that degree, I, 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 I get where you're getting there. Yeah. yeah, the illustrious Mrs. Movie Man didn't actually want to go and see this because <laughs> she doesn't like horrors and she thought the trailer was actually portraying it as much more of a mm. horror type movie than it actually turned out to be. <laughs> I actually enjoyed Death on the Nile more than Murder on the Orient Express. <laughs> I thought it was glossy and I loved the performance of Emma Mackey and Gal Gadot and, and I thought the whole thing was really lush and, and glossy, old fashioned picture. Didn't get any of that from this. This this felt, I was really disappointed by this one. It just didn't work for me as a glossy, old fashioned, kind of Twilight Zone Tower of Terror type thing. It didn't work for me as the murder mystery either. I thought the performances were pretty hammy. 
I, I really liked Jude Hill in Belfast. Uh, he really annoyed me as a hair flick of the Gestapo. <laughs> Uh, he, even though right, it's father and son again with Jamie Dornan in, in, the, in the film. There was a very interesting little bit of trivia. I think, again, I might have heard this on Komodo Mayo today, that in Belfast, the young boy opens a Christmas present and one of his Christmas presents he opens is the book Halloween Party, Halloween Party. Which, yes, which, which, is, which is amazing. Yeah. So it must have been yeah. kind of Branagh working through a little in-joke yeah. there. But that's, yeah. a, that's a great little bit of trivia. But I, I, it, it just didn't didn't work for me. I was just very, I thought it was flat and disappointing. I thought some of the shots of kind of pigeons on the streets of Venice kind of were almost kind of just stuck in there in order to fill it out. It didn't seem to add anything to the atmosphere like the shots of the streets and so on in Equalizer 3 did to that film. So for some reason, it, it, it just didn't click with me. I'm probably being a grumpy old bastard here, right? But it, it just... I was disappointed. Scores on the doors. I'm going to give this one a um, a very grumpy five out of ten. Uh, Emma, uh, I'm going to give it a not quite so grumpy six. Six. <laughs> Scott, I'm going to give it an even lesser grumpy seven. <laughs> okay, and Andy, I'm going to give a seven as well. It was okay. Fun. So that's fourteen twenty twenty five. Divided by four is 6.25 for the Flickering Dream score. So I'm sorry, Emma, and I have dragged this one down. It was borderline anyway, but this one is definitely a... <laughs> for Haunting in Venice. Okay. We're going to move on to another film. Greek Island, Beautiful Sunshine, Laughter, lots of really great jokes. Mama Mia. Really yeah. great... <laughs> Feel good film, Mamma Mia! I'm talking about Mamma Mia. Here we go again. What a great film that is. My wife saw it eight times at the cinema. We'll still put it, it on every single time. Yeah. So, um, what's not to love about Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia? Here we go again. Right. But we're going to talk now about uh, my big fat Greek wedding for me. Um, Andy, could you introduce this cinematic masterpiece to us? If I have to. Um... It's got some actors in it, allegedly. <laughs> it's got a script writer, allegedly. It had a director, allegedly. We better just show you a clip, I suppose. Here it is. Drink! Don't worry, a lady is never drunk. Uh, uh. I have never seen my mom drink anything more than communion wine. Hey, we're thirsty. <laughs> Whee! Uh, wow, spoilers, yeah. Andy. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I have seen this one. I went to see this one this afternoon. Uh, but I'll let you start with it, Andy. When I when I posted my review, I simply quoted, having seen Bambi the other week, the advice that was given to Thumper. <laughs> Thumper in Bambi is told, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I, I mean, seriously, this was just... A steaming pile of cold moussaka that tasted awful and made me want to vomit all the way home. It's absolute rubbish. Laugh, I thought I'd never start. I saw it with 30 other people in the oh. cinema roundabout. Not one person even chuckled out loud. Somebody sneezed, which kind of woke <laughs> us all up a little bit. Um, and I think uh, somebody coughed, which again woke us, kept us awake as well. Yeah. Nice. It, Reminded me nice. of my visit to Athens. That's about it. It's rubbish. Mm. Move on. Forget it. Nobody yeah. wanted it. Nobody asked for it. Nobody cares tuppence about it. Forget <laughs> it. Let's move on. <laughs> I, I think I'm the only one who, other one who's seen this one. Or have you seen it, Scott? I've not seen this. No. Don't, don't, Scott, signs of it. Don't, yeah. you know, don't. Scott. Save no, yourself. No, no, save no, you know, save no, yourself. Save yourself. Exactly. You'll only encourage them to go and make another one. I mean, please, just don't I mean, go and see it. Please. Yeah. In, interestingly, I noticed that, that Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were uh, I could some not of the believe production what, team behind this. What was Tom Hanks getting into with this? I, mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, if, if I 
if I can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I, I will give it to you that the it was filmed on location in Corfu, and some of the Corfu landscape is nice. Some of the nice Greek chinky chinky music is um, is pleasant. But on, honestly, I I smiled. I smiled twice in this. Wow. Film. Yeah, I smiled. I didn't laugh. Wow. I did not laugh once, but I smiled. There was a, a comment about making out like two badgers in a sack of Oreos, which I thought was a, oh. a, a an, an interesting vision. And there was one where uh, they were talking about working out arguments by using the Greek way of, of applying shame and guilt, which I thought was quite a good line. Well, um, at that point, I was, be, I was losing the will to live, so I probably yeah, wasn't paying yeah. attention by that point anyway. Yeah, indeed. Um, the, the only linkage with Mamma Mia, apart from the nice scenery, was the lady who uh, has that line about um, karma pronounced ha. She was one of the actresses in this uh, film. There was some bisexual purple haired mare who was went just went around shrieking all the time. Can I just say, and coming they're up... going to, they are going to Greece, they're going to a reunion. But they're going to meet people they've never met. How can you have a reunion with people that you've never met? The whole thing falls down at that point. I you I cannot know. have a reunion with people you've never met. Uh, Get and, a script and, writer for Pete's sake. And there's, and there's a wonderful... Don't strike, Andy. <laughs> like, this is Sag, this is Sag oh. Afra's fault, yeah. You, no, we, we rattle on about um, show, don't tell. I mean, this is the most egregious bit of telling what's happening in the plot. Like, the main part of this plot is that uh, her father's died and they need to return this journal for some completely baffling unknown reason to these three childhood friends in Greece who they don't know and don't know where they are. and don't. Have they're met. having a reunion with and them. They're having a reunion with them. That's fair enough. And the, the most egregious delivery of tell rather than show is that they get this husband's wife who has semi-dementia and says do you know what we're doing here and she has to go through the whole thing of saying yes you're going to take this journal off my dead husband and you're going to take it to Greece back to his village where he lived and you're going to find his and it, getting uh, somebody with dementia to recount the script of the story just as a vehicle to get into the story is absolutely outrageous so, and so then this... and then if that wasn't in your head enough every other minute it is oh have you still got the journal that we have to take to the Greece to the three friends god what? do you remember that awful film early this year love again with Celine Dion yes giving yes, advice it's... about giving advice yep. about love from her songs there's a that scene in that where she's She's rehearsing in a stadium for her first night of her stadium tour. It's the afternoon. She's rehearsing in the stadium. Somebody comes in and says, Miss Dion, will you approve the tour posters? And you go, yeah. what? And it, My big I think fat the same great wedding, writers. whatever it is, is on a par with that. It is I, I think so. rubbish. It is, it is absolutely bonkers. It is bonkers. Score, and he <laughs> out of 10. Well, I'm going to be very, very kind, Bob, and give it nothing. <laughs> there are no minuses in flickering dreams remember that nothing i can't give it a point it's rubbish yeah i am going to i'm going to give it 2 out of 10 just for the scenery and the chinky 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 music right but that's it so that's a flickering dream score which i think is probably a record for the year of 1 out of 10 for my big fat greek wedding free uh, this is a film that's not just bad it's just actively atrocious in particular bits and a complete waste of celluloid so avoid um, I, would like, I would like to say i give that review 10 out of 10 though that was very entertaining oh, good thank you very much guys <laughs> there we go <laughs> okay good good we'll put that on the highlights you can be the highlight <laughs> comment yeah um <laughs> Right, we're moving on to a film which I haven't seen. I'm not sure uh, whether any of you other guys have seen called None 2, None But the Brave. I think, Andy, this is over to you to uh, intro okay, the clip. so when Mark Kermode reviews horror movies, he often talks about them being quiet, 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 bang. This is quiet, 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 none. <laughs> Here's a clip. <laughs> What are we doing here? Playing a game. It's called 
defy the devil. Whatever you do, whatever you hear, don't look away. Okay, so the number two, we're in France, we're in the mid fifties, uh, we're in a uh, in a uh, monastery that is about to be turned into a boarding school. The nun from the first movie uh, that was set in Romania is moving west, looking for uh, a particular object that the the this de demonic nun needs to have ultimate power, uh, and she, it's it's in this uh, monastery that's now been turned into a school. So she starts haunting the, searching the place. Basically, the demonic nun is searching this old monastery, looking for a particular object that's going to give her an awful lot of power. And uh, the way she finds it is that there is a particular room that's got a stained glass window in it. And it reminded me of Rages of the Lost Ark. When the sun <laughs> shines through the stained glass window, right through the goat's eye, who's in the middle of the... Why well, you put a goat in the middle of a stained glass window? Right through the goat's eye in the middle of a stained glass window, a beam appears, and it points you on the floor to the hidden chamber where this particular object needs that this ghost needs. Yes, exactly. It's not scary. It's not frightening. It's quiet, quiet, bang, quiet, quiet, bang. There were no real jumps. I wasn't scared. I wasn't unnerved. I was fairly entertained by a horror film that wasn't horrifying. Some good performances, but on the whole, again, a sequel that nobody was crying out for and one we didn't we could have done without. But there you go, mm -hmm. they've decided to make it. And the uh it's in the world of the conjuring. So I should say to people, if you are going to see uh the nun two, uh and please don't get into the bad habit, boom boom, of of, of <laughs> going to see these films. Habit nuns where a habit anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Um we're with you. It's terrible we're with you. to explain your own jokes. Um, there is a mid-credit scene. We're with you in demonic spirit, yes. <laughs> there is a mid-credit scene which actually links it with the other Conjuring films, with the Conjuring films, and would appear to indicate that there's going to be a Nun 3. Personally, I would like there to be a Nun Nun, but uh, there is going to be a Nun 3 <laughs> looking at that. Okay, so there we go. These Conjuring films are going to drop the ball at some point. They are. I mean, somebody cracked a joke uh, on the uh, about it being about it being uh, a wimpolsicle. Um <laughs> Again, referring to nuns' dresses, but it uh, it's fine. It's uh, you know, one of these days a horror film is going to come along that's really going to scare us. That's really going to make us jump. I haven't had that experience really with a horror film since Mother. I don't know how many of you saw Mother, oh. but I sat in the cinema watching that. And that was the last time I remember sitting in the cinema, sweating, looking at the screen through my open hands, grabbing hold of my seat. That film still has an effect on me to this day. Um, mm. So I'm just longing for a horror film to come along and, and really do the business. This one doesn't. Well, but it passes the time. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be the new Exorcist film that comes out next month. <laughs> well, you never know. As Mark said last night, it might be quite good. <laughs> yeah, it, it might be, yes. We should explain, we went to uh, the Mark Commode uh, event at the BFI last night and they showed the 50th anniversary of The Exorcist, which to my shame, as a cinephile, I have never seen before. So I saw it on the big screen and it was yeah, quietly disturbing, but entertaining. Yeah. I mean, I thought Mark Commode, who introduced it, speaking only for 20 minutes, was very restrained. Um, well, I'm glad he was. I yeah. sent him a text today congratulating him on being so restrained. But I'm desperate for a horror film to come along that's really going to give me the chills and really yeah. going to upset me and really going to, you know, maybe go, oh, The Nun 2 doesn't do that. It's a continuation of the story. There's going to be a third one. Take it or leave yeah. it. It's up to you. Okay. Score, uh, Andy, just uh, five. on your score. Five, five out of ten. Average. Pretty average, so just based on Andy's yeah. opinion, that makes none <laughs> to none but a. Yeah. 
Okay, we're going to finish with a um, film which, again, which I haven't seen. I think this is might just be you, Scott. This is new on Netflix, and this is called Once Upon a Crime. Can you introduce that to us? Uh, of course. So this one is a Japanese film that you can find on Netflix. In this story, we see a twist on classic fairy tales as Little Red Ed Riding Hood meets up with Cinderella. They end up getting put into dresses by a witch and going on their way to the ball together. But when they're on their way, they come across a dead body and it all turns into a murder mystery. Here's a clip. This, this sounds like some perverted version of Shrek. Live, is it live action? With... It is live action. <laughs> Scott, okay. does it owe any allegiance to the TV series Once Upon a Time? Because my it's... daughter got me hooked on that. I, I love, love that, that show. show. Yeah, I think yeah. it's an amazing show. And there's moments where you can see a little bit of a similarity okay. in some ways. Thank you. Yeah. So this one, for me, it's a bit of an oddity, to be honest, as I'm sure you'll be aware just from that intro. It yeah. <laughs> plays very young. I think it's very campy. I think it is possibly aimed at teenagers. You know what? It is kind of fun. So you get the sense early on of the characters and their interaction with this witch that she meets who can magically give them dresses, beautiful costumes, the the film in general is full of amazing costumes but the witch has a problem with shoes she can't quite get them right so when she tries to give them shoes she ends up with like muddy boots because she just can't get that part of the magic right a little random but okay i'm going with it the the fact that this turns into a murder mystery is so interesting because it plays out where they get to the ball and they go through all the sort of usual things from the fairy tale where the prince is having this ball to find a wife and there's different narratives that are going on at the same time there in terms of that part of the storyline but then one of the guards comes in says there's been a dead body and yeah it turns into we were speaking about haunting in venice earlier it's a bit of a sort of poirot type murder mystery where they're all trying to work out clues there's blood here there's a clue that's been left there. What could this mean? What could this kind of person have done it? And yeah, when you're playing into the fairy tales and the murder mystery together, I thought it was kind of a clever attempt. I don't think it always worked. And maybe there's some panto style of humor going on. And this might be a Japanese thing, but I think it's one that you will all enjoy to a certain extent. Whether you say it's good or not is a different question. But I've got a feeling all three of you, if you watch it, you will enjoy the oddity of it. I I liked it. I'm not going to go far enough to say that it's actively a good film. But while it was on, I was like, this is fairly enjoyable. Okay. Score out of 10. So I'm going to give this a 6 out of 10. Okay. So just based on Scott's view, that's a flickering dream score of 6 out of 10, which makes it a borderline, I'm afraid. But, yeah, I might give that one a go. I've just got such a stack of films that I need to um, catch up and watch. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll add that to my ever-increasing list. Right, that's all we've got this week. Any other business from any of you? We we might be a little bit disrupted over the next few weeks because the London Film Festival is starting in uh, two weeks' time, but the press screenings are in the next two weeks. So um, we'll we'll try and fit in some episodes of um, the Flickering Dreams just, podcast when we can. Just one thing for people out there with young kids and families. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but the new film is animated film is out on Friday in cinemas called The Canterville Ghost, based on the famous Noel Coward story. It's a bit Scooby Doo, 
Uh, I was watching it as a screen of the other day. It's a lot of fun. Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie are reunited um, on the vocal cast. It's got a great... Soupy twist. Um, yeah, it's got a great <laughs> crack, uh, vocal cast. If you want to take your kids to see something at the cinema, it's good fun. It's good. good. Fun. All right. Thank you. For there that. is one small thing that I could bring up is that we saw in the news this week that ITV have picked up the Oscars. We were talking yes. earlier on about how Now TV or Sky Cinema had lost the rights after 20 years. It seems ITV have picked up the ball and we'll be able to see it after all. Wonderful. I presume that they're going to show it live overnight. Um, Hopefully. I, mean, I, can't, I can't imagine that they wouldn't, but yes, you never can tell, can you? But yeah, you would you would have to hope that they're going to show it live overnight. It would be good. Yeah. That is that is very good news to well. Separately, at the weekend, on I think it's Sunday, yeah. there is a Medi Cinema screening of Paw Patrol, the new movie. Now you'll laugh at me. The first one was bloody amazing, so I, I <laughs> don't laugh. It was good. <laughs> Medi Cinema is the is that uh, outfit that City World support, aren't they? I've seen the adverts yeah. where they basically put cinemas into hospitals, which I think is a great kind of charity uh, thing. When When's that? Is that all over the country or is that a, a particular? Uh, I just saw it in the app and I booked it instantly. So I don't know. Uh, there are a couple <laughs> of previews before it comes out. But yeah, there's right. one this Sunday. Good. Okay. Uh, so my thanks to um, Emma from Emma at the Movies on Twitter, from Scott Forbes, from the Forbes Film and TV Review on Facebook, and from the Reverend Andy Godfrey from Sorted Magazine and Connect Radio. And I'm Bob Mann from One Man's Movies and occasionally on BBC Radio Solent. Uh, so that's our flickering dreams for this time. I think this might even be episode 30 that we're on, which is a bit of a milestone, but we're on our way to number 50, aren't we? So uh, thanks very much, and we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much for listening or watching Flickering Dreams. You can find the video version on YouTube and the audio version on all major podcast platforms. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get each of the weekly episodes as they are released. We'll see you at the movies.